Hey, it's Chris. After nearly two months, my new MacBook Pro finally showed up. And so today I wanna to show you the apps, settings, and accessories that I'm using to get the most out of this thing in case you find them useful as well. So let's start with some apps. I think my core productivity apps are probably Spark for email, Apple Notes, and also My Mind for notes, Brave as my browser, MindNode for outlining and mind maps, Final Cut Pro for video editing, and Photoshop for photo editing. So Spark I recently rediscovered and it's been a huge improvement for me over Apple Mail. For some reason, Apple Mail across all my devices was hiding important emails from me and Spark doesn't do that Plus, I really like the batch actions. So if it's been a little while since you tried it, give it another go. Trust me, I think you're really gonna like it. And by the way, it's free. Now, Apple Notes, I know it's kind of boring, but honestly, it's where I keep and make most of what I'd call my important notes. And I have to say, I especially love that Quick Notes have spread from the iPad to the Mac. So just being able to hit Function Q on your keyboard to pull up a Quick Note is pretty awesome. My Mind, though, is a notes app that I use to save everything I know I'm gonna want to remember and use later on especially since it's not just a web app anymore and there's actually a real native Mac app. So not only is it private and has no social features, but I also love that I don't have to think about organization because the AI just handles all that for me because seriously, it just has such a powerful search function. Now, when it comes to browsers, I like Safari, I really do, but the plugins that I actually rely on to run my business just aren't there. So instead, I'm using the Brave browser because it's basically Chrome, but without all the Google baggage. What's my favorite web app to use? within Brave? Well, that of course would be Jasper, the AI writing assistant, which I know subscribers have heard me talk about many times before, but wow, one click to help you rephrase the things that you've typed or one click to explain something that you've written to a child. It's just an incredibly valuable tool, not just for productivity, but especially if you do anything that's related to marketing, or business, and actually I subscribe to Boss Mode, the top tier, because it lets Jasper write you entire articles based on simple prompts. And speaking of browser stuff, I also use Substack in Brave because that's where I write the daily tech newsletter, it comes out on Fridays once a week, so if you're looking for some great uh, app and accessory and service recommendations, that is the place to check that out. It's linked up down in the description. But I'm still using MindNode for outlining and for mind maps. I feel like it's old, but it's gold. It's been around for a while, but it's so useful. One of my all-time favorite MindNode features is a Mac feature, because it's on all the different Apple platforms, including the Apple Watch. But I can go up to my Mac menu bar and tap on Quick Entry, and I can just create an outline right there. Final Cut Pro is pretty self-explanatory. It's where I edit videos. I prefer it because it's made for the Mac. The optimizations are ridiculous. Photoshop, on the other hand, is very legacy. It's been around forever. I'm still actually using it though, because it does so much, I'm familiar with it, and I can use remove.bg, one of my favorite plugins, which just makes it really easy to remove backgrounds right in Photoshop with one click. So yeah, probably one of my most used workflows. Now, outside of these core apps, I do have some utilities that I use that make life a little bit easier or more fun. And it's funny because everyone told me, don't use Bartender anymore. You have to switch to vanilla. One is free, vanilla, that's why people like it, but Bartender, if you haven't tried it for a while, there's so many new features in the latest version. It's such an upgrade. There's a new quick reveal. So if you just hover over it, it's gonna show you. And actually I got this floating bartender bar now. You can see it in the top right here. I love that. You can mess with the menu bar item spacing. There's a quick search. You've got triggers, hotkeys, Apple script support, new menu bar items. I mean, vanilla is fine if you do want something for free. I'll link them both, but I'm gonna stick with bartender because I'm looking for the best experience, not just the cheapest. Similarly, I've always used Magnet to organize my workspace in terms of keeping windows organized. But then I started getting all these comments. No, you gotta use Rectangle because it's free. And Rectangle's all right, I'm just used to using Magnet. I'm used to the hotkeys and the shortcuts. It works flawlessly with my external display. I can just count on it. Now the days of having to use a password manager, much less passwords at all, are swiftly coming to an end thanks to Apple's new passkeys feature, which they announced at WWDC. But passwords aren't quite dead yet, and so in the meantime, I'm still using 1Password. Like, I like the family management features. I like the watchtower feature, which helps keep you more secure. And this is another one where people are like, why wouldn't you just use LastPass? Because they have a free personal plan and you have to pay for 1Password. Yeah, I'm already set up on 1Password. I like it, but I'll link both up. Now, I do a lot of screen recording, both with and without audio, and I love Apple's built-in features which actually runs through the QuickTime app, but there are times when I need to record with my face, and when I do that, I use Loom. Loom is nice because it's just simple, it's easy, it does everything you need, but the best part is the sharing is really simple, so that's why you use Loom. I also use Amphetamine, the app. 
it's another oldie but goldie that keeps your Mac awake when you have something important going on and you don't want it to go to sleep. Now, these are just the immediate apps that I already use that I got set up when this new thing arrived, but it's been a while since I did an unbelievably useful Mac apps video. The first one I ever made four years ago now has 800,000 views, but I think it's about time for another unbelievably useful Mac apps video. So if you're not subscribed already, now's the time. All right, let's talk about the settings that I like to change and tweak as soon as a new Mac arrives. Obviously, when the new Mac hits, there's usually a software update waiting, so I get that out of the way right away. But the very next thing I like to do is customize Finder because I use it so often. So usually, I'll drag something that I want to get quick access to over into the sidebar here, so it's nice and easy. But if something's really important, I'll hold down Command plus Option and drag that up to the top of my toolbar. And actually, if you double click up there, you can hit customize toolbar and really tweak things the way that you want. Of course, I gotta get my trackpad and mouse settings all ironed out right away too, because if there's one thing I can't stand, it's a slow cursor. So I head over to point and click and I turn that tracking speed way up. The next thing I do, of course, is change my wallpaper. And while the default wallpapers that Apple puts out there are really great, they do just get a little boring, which is why I went ahead and created a whole bunch of wallpapers myself. All right, so I'll link these up for you and you can check them out. They're wallpaper packs that work on all all your different devices. And it's very clear from the downloads that people like the Shades pack, which you're seeing here, and the Nebulous pack, which you're seeing right here, the best. Ah, there we go. Now, I like my dock hidden and out of the way. And you can see how I got it set up here in terms of size and magnification. And I'm gonna play around and stick it over on the side. I know some people get crazy, like, how can you use that dock down on the bottom, you monster? I don't know, it's cool how it is. But if anybody remembers from my last Mac setup video, I had these spacers down on my dock, which you had to like input some code into the terminal to get that spacer. And then I could separate my different groups of apps. And that was kind of cool, but I'm not gonna do that this time around just because I wanna do something different now that I've had it that way. But I'm gonna link up that technique for you down in the description just so you can check it out if you wanna try it. Now, hot corners are super useful to me, and this is how I have those set up. I've got the screensaver ready to go. I've got two set up to show me the desktop. I also have a quick note because it's nice to have function queue all set up and ready to go to get a quick note going, but it's even easier to just swipe down into the corner and get that going there. Now, speaking of screensavers, I do tend to like the ones that Apple puts out with the new releases of every version of Mac OS now, but there's just something about the Ficlo clock screensaver that I'm just not ready to give up yet. This thing's classic and I've been using it in videos since forever on the iPad too but it's just nice, it looks good, and I'm still using it. Now, one thing I like to go into settings and check under battery is optimized battery charging. And basically, this is just there to help keep your battery healthier for longer over time. But here's the thing, I like to turn this on because I'm not mobile all the time. Probably most of the time, I'm sitting there at the desk and this is hooked in and charging uh, while I'm using my external monitor, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. But there are times when I pick this up and I take it with me either around the house or just at the coffee shop, or maybe I'm doing some traveling, something like that, a meeting, and then it waits to charge past the 80% when I get back at the desk and plug it in uh, until I'm done doing everything else and just optimizes that way. And that's really nice. Now, when it comes to desktop organization, I'm definitely not the type of person who's got stuff all over the place, you know, an icon jammed in every free opening. Instead, I've gotten really used to the stacks system, as you can see, so I double click on my desktop and I say use stacks. If you turn that off, it gets a lot crazier, right? I can't stand that, so stacks it is. Now, Touch ID comes with the Mac, and a lot of people out there, I think, just scan one fingerprint, which is fine, that works, but I like to add a couple more because it seems like it's usually handy when you have your hands full, you know? So I got the index finger and I scan my thumb too, and even another fingerprint, because however I arrive, however my hands are full, I can still reach down and unlock the Mac. All right, let's talk a little bit about desk setup and accessories. So what am I using right now to get the most out of this? By the way, I'm gonna have more videos coming out with lots of new accessories that I've discovered that are on order, on the way. So again, if you're not already subscribed, Now's the time. I like Apple hardware, so you can't fault me for using a lot of Apple accessories, including the AirPods Max. They're really my go-to when I'm sitting there at the desk because they're comfy and they sound good and the noise cancellation is really great. Although I will say I do pop in the Beats Fit Pros from time to time at the desk anytime I can't mess up the hair, like if I'm going somewhere, or if I'm gonna film a video or something. In terms of monitors, I'm currently using this LG 40 inch curved ultra wide. It's a 5K 2K display, it has Thunderbolt. A 40 inch ultra wide really seems like the sweet spot for me in terms of resolution 
resolution and usability. And I recently made a whole video about that. So I'm gonna link it up in the description instead of going overboard talking about it right here. But I will say, because I'm using that ultra wide and also because I sometimes use the Mac in clamshell mode when it's closed, Touch ID is not always available. And I'm not always wearing my Apple Watch either to just show up and I have everything unlock with my Apple Watch automatically. So I do have the Magic Keyboard with Touch ID as part of my setup right now as well because it's just so convenient. And even though Logitech came out with this MX Mechanical Keyboard recently, and there's so many other great keyboard options out there, many of which I personally like, it's just this Touch ID is sort of like the trump card right now for me in terms of usability, so it stays. I should also note that I've got a 12 terabyte G Drive storage solution hooked up to the back of the monitor, so it's nice to just have one cable coming from the monitor to the Mac, and then I can plug something in like this 12 terabyte storage unit into the back of the monitor and just have this really simple, nice one cable solution. For a Mac stand, I'm still using the old 12 South Curve, because I find that it still works really well if I still wanna see that Mac monitor and not use it in clamshell mode. But also it gives me a little bit of storage space underneath it. So sitting in that little storage area, I've got the Scarlett Solo audio interface. And the reason I have that hooked up is so that I can hook in an XLR microphone for really high quality audio in terms of like podcasts and voiceovers. And at my desk, the mic I've got hooked in there is the Shure MV7. And this is a microphone that's not only super customizable in terms of the look, but it also has some of the vibes of the legendary SM7B in terms of how it sounds for like half the price. So can't recommend it more highly, especially with the Scarlett Solo. So I'll link those up for you as well. Now, I really like the MX Master Mouse. I've been using it forever, especially as a creator. There's so many buttons. You can just activate and customize those to your heart's content. But my heart isn't content using that when I've got an Apple trackpad sitting around because the trackpad just does so much. At the end of the day, once you get used to it, you just can't beat the gestures. Finally, for the accessories, I'm experimenting with this crazy professional dual webcam setup from Kensington. So I'm gonna have a whole video coming out showing you this Kensington setup but this is as pro as a webcam setup really gets. I mean, not only do you have great quality in terms of the video and the microphone, but it also comes with all these mounting accessories, some great software, and this ring light like you can see in this setup. And I actually like the Kensington arms that you can mount the cameras on. They're sturdy enough that I can mount my Shure microphone on there as well, and that's where I record the podcast, which is probably a good time to let you know that there's a daily tag podcast that comes out on Fridays, which is gonna be linked up down in the description. All right, so that's how I'm starting things out with the brand new Mac. Hopefully you found some interesting stuff. Again, everything will be linked up for you down in the description, but I'm not ready to stop hanging out. So we're gonna go the extra mile today and just kind of continue the discussion. Have you seen the camera on the back of the Xiaomi 12S Ultra? It's enormous. I had to talk about this because it just makes you think, where are cameras on phones headed. Xiaomi's got this Leica partnership and they put an absolutely enormous sensor in their phone, much larger than the sensor on even the largest pro iPhone. So the camera is actually a quad camera setup, but it's got a 50.3 megapixel setup. And when you compare the sensors, here's the Xiaomi CEO showing off the difference between the iPhone 13 Pro Max and this Xiaomi sensor here, 2.7 times bigger on the Xiaomi. And you know, what does that do? If for somebody who's not like really into this stuff, you know, the bigger the sensor, the more detail, the more light that you're gonna capture. And the question is how much of a difference does it actually make? Cause the iPhone's still running on a 12 megapixel setup. Now here's a video that somebody put out comparing the quality between the video that's captured on both of these. You know, I, and this is through YouTube. So all the YouTube compression, you know, nonsense or whatever, but you can't really notice a huge, huge difference by the time it gets to the end product, which is when you're showing it to somebody online. And even with most of the photos, I'm not seeing like, a crazy huge difference with the Xiaomi. Although I will say I've noticed a little bit of extra detail is visible with that Xiaomi that I don't see over on the iPhones, just from this comparison here. But the iPhone actually captures more of the detail in the clouds in this picture, right? But if you look down at the rocks on the 12S Ultra, I feel like there's a little more depth and information there. Now for subscribers, if you think back to my iPhone versus Android video that I made fairly recently, that's been very popular, very different than other comparisons, right? One of the things that came up in that video was that, you know, the iPhone, you can kind of know what to expect year to year. It's often very iterative, but it just works. You can rely on it. And it's very, very high quality in terms of software, hardware, et cetera, but sometimes boring. 
On the Android side of things, we talked about how the Android makers are really competing against themselves more than the iPhone. And there's so many, there's so much competition that they kind of come out with things that look like they're gonna be mind blowing to people. And oftentimes they end up being sort of gimmicky, right? Or just for show. Obviously not always, that's not always the case, but this sort of strikes me as one of those things. And I will just say before we get any further, I do really wish that the iPhone would come out with a periscopic zoom. I would love a better optical, actually good zoom on the iPhone, like some Androids have had for a while now. But a lot of people are gonna look at the back of this phone, which is mostly camera, and they're gonna think, wow, the iPhone's so far behind. But I haven't tested this out yet, right? I'm just seeing the samples because this thing's so new online, just like anybody else. But my guess is, it's not something that's gonna make people switch from an iPhone. Because the iPhone has a really, really capable, reliable camera. And with Apple's cinematic mode, Apple's not immune from putting out some gimmicky features themselves. But I will say, when you factor out the camera, so you're not even thinking about the cameras, you know, Apple has this whole ecosystem of which the iPhone is just one puzzle piece and it fits in so nicely, snaps together with all these other puzzle pieces, and you get a bigger, better picture inside the Apple ecosystem. Now that's arguable, and actually some people feel trapped inside the Apple ecosystem, right, with all these sunk costs, like I already got AirPods and an iPad, so when it comes to buying a computer, even if I don't want a Mac, that's really what makes the most sense. But either way, and some people, by the way, are very happy inside the Apple ecosystem, too, because of all the optimizations that can happen there. But it is intriguing. You look at this and you think, what if Apple, pushed things this far, went way overboard with the camera, what would be possible? And that's an interesting thing to think about. You guys let me know. Give me some comments and some feedback down there. Would you like to see Apple head in this direction or do you like the way things are going? Let's talk about TikTok a little bit. I get this all the time, like, Chris, you make videos, why aren't you on TikTok? Because we're way past the phase where TikTok was just for like younger generations, right? Everybody's getting on TikTok. It's really gone mainstream and it's like, well, shouldn't you be on all the platforms? And I always tell people, I just don't really like TikTok as an app or a company. It's not that I'm against uh, you know, vertical videos that are shorter, although that has wreaked havoc as, as YouTube has introduced shorts uh, and are trying to make that play nice with the algorithm, right? The traditional long form algorithm. But this article's out and it's talking about TikTok has confirmed that some China-based employees can access US user data. And here's this tweet where somebody's like, it's strategically epic that the US government has allowed a Chinese app to become the dominant platform of its young generations. China doesn't allow the reverse. They block Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Google, etc. And in terms of reciprocity, the US is getting owned here. So the US government has been concerned for a while about what can China access about all of its citizens? Is TikTok spyware? And even if it's not, look at all the data that they have about the population. This can be used for manipulation, if nothing else. So in the recent past, TikTok has said, no, 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 don't be worried. You know, all the US information is kept here. It's local on this continent. And you know, the, the Chinese side of the TikTok empire really doesn't have anything to do with this. You know, we're just running this service for you. And then this comes out and TikTok is now promising to step up security and privacy and stuff. It's like, you can't even trust American companies to protect user privacy, really, right? Think about Google, Meta, et cetera, Amazon. Apple's out here and they're at least trying to make things more private. But it's so weird. We're living in this crazy globalized world. Everything is so interdependent. And it's like, can you, first of all, can you imagine if the US was like, that's it for TikTok? like shut it down. In fact, they did ask, the government did ask Apple and Google to delist TikTok from their app stores, which obviously hasn't happened. But imagine the uproar, the outcry, even if it was demonstrably true that TikTok, which I have no idea because I'm not in the, in the government, that TikTok was bad for America. Let's just say you could prove that, right? Imagine the outcry if you took that away from people. It's like giving people ice cream and then taking it away. People love TikTok. So, you know, I'm just saying here, like people ask me, why aren't you on TikTok? I'm not on TikTok for a number of reasons, uh, but this doesn't make it any better, right? Uh, I try to protect the privacy as much as possible, which is basically impossible in today's world. Increasingly, it seems like that's something that would be considered a luxury. <laughs> so if you have uh, a certain amount of wealth or status, maybe you can be more private than somebody who doesn't. But I guess the other side of the equation is, how many people even care 
in the US? What happens to their data? I mean, we've been fine over here as a populace with people mining our data and selling our data and our data getting hacked uh, for years, for decades now, right? It just seems to be the norm. And it's kind of unfortunate. It's like the frog boiling in the pot there. The temperature has been turned up so slowly over the years that we're just boiling and, and nobody cares. No one's gonna leap out of the pot because it's just normal now. That's the normal temperature. I'd actually really like to know what everybody in the audience thinks about the whole TikTok thing. Do you care, do you not? Uh, you know, Do you use TikTok or not and why? Let me know. Something I wanted to cover on here because I know other people out there are looking for it is how to set a timer for your music. So I use this if I wanna like sleep to some music at night and I didn't know how to do this for a really long time because there's a sleep timer in an app like Audible or something like that where you can say, hey, after 30 minutes or an hour, then just shut off so I don't have to worry about it. Well, how do you do that if you're using Apple Music? There is a way, but it has some drawbacks. On your iPhone, what you wanna do is go into your clock app, select the timer, and then tap on when the timer ends. Now, usually when a timer ends, there's some audio that plays, either like a ringtone, right? Or you could have that set up to play some music or something. But what if you want no music to play? Well, that's actually an option. So you scroll down to the bottom, you select stop playing, and then tap set in the corner, and then you're good to go. But the caveat here is when you actually want to use a timer and you do want it to actually notify you with some sound or a song or something, you gotta go back and switch that, right? So you might be able to set up a shortcut or something to automate this a little bit better. But if you do this and then you're like, realize that your timers aren't doing anything for you, they're not like going off, it's just something that you actively kind of have to manage, which is a pain. I wanna talk a little bit about Apple's MagSafe battery pack. I was one of the people when this came out who had the contrary view of saying I liked it and I still like it. I use it all the time. People didn't like that it didn't charge your phone completely. If it was at like 1%, are you gonna get to 100%? No, you're not. And that just blew people's mind. They're like, how can this be so expensive Apple's putting this out here and it's not even gonna charge my phone all the way. And there I was, one of the only people saying, no, wait a second, this is actually very useful and it's not enormous, which is a big bonus. And it's just gonna to top you off, keep you going without being too bulky. That's a win for me. Now I get it, not everybody has the same opinion as I do clearly from the comments on that video. So I just wanna talk about what are some of the best alternatives. Anchor has one of the best alternatives out there. It's the Anchor MagGo. And it's pretty cool because it's a built-in stand plus a MagSafe charger. One thing I like about it too is just it looks pretty good. And there's lots of options as you can see, so you can really customize it. Probably my favorite alternative to Apple's MagSafe charger. Now, if you're looking for something that has a little screen on it to let you know how much percentage there is, you might like iWalk's Magnetic Powerless Bank, which also has a ring for your finger, which makes it a little bit easier, kind of like a pop socket to hold. And it does have a 6,000 milliamp hour capacity, which is not bad. Maybe the best thing about this one though is the price. It's like under 40 bucks, so that's hard to beat. Of course, I will point out, if you get Apple's official one, there are some benefits like, being able to see you know, how much percentage is left in the widget, the battery widget on your iPhone, I'm just saying. Now, if you're looking for super high capacity, I'm gonna link up the Suio magnetic power bank for you. This thing is 10,000 milliamp hours. The last one we talked about earlier, remember that was 6,000. This one also is cheaper than Apple's, it's just 49.99. Of course, sometimes with these brands, these off brands, Maybe there's gonna be some compatibility issues or you know, what are you gonna do with service and support? Probably next to non-existent compared to Apple's. But, but here's a good option if you really wanna jam in a ton of extra charging. If you don't mind spending just a little bit more, $59.99, I'd probably rather go with Belkin's Boost Charge, a magnetic portable wireless charger. That thing still gets 10,000 milliamp hours. I don't know, I just trust Belkin, at least they're a household name, right? People know who they are, especially if you need to like do a return or support or something, gonna be better than a completely no-namer, right? But check this out, if you're absolutely insane, you get this 25,000 milliamp hour battery bank here that works with MagSafe for $319. I don't know who would buy this, <laughs> but it's kind of funny that it just exists in the first place. Wow, that's more than double the 10,000 milliamp hours on the last couple that we checked out, I wouldn't touch this thing, right? I'm not gonna bring this around with me when I'm going uh, you know, somewhere, but wow. The last one I wanna show you is the RapidX Booster. 
and it's got a 5,000 milliamp hour uh, capacity, but it comes in a bunch of different colors, right? So red, blue, pink, yellow, teal, black, white, lots of options, 49.99. All right, I think that's gonna wrap it up for today's episode. Don't forget, the Daily Tech newsletter is new. It's out, there's one issue waiting for you already. Last but not least, follow us at Daily Tech, spelled daily, T-E-K-K, on Instagram and Twitter. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Later.